millisieverts in some way that you could follow them and see if they have a slightly tiny, tiny increase in, their, in what are already fairly rare cancers. Um, so nobody really knows what goes on down here. The conservative assumption, and I think there is some evidence for it, but I'm not clear exactly how it works, is that this line is just proportional. So yeah, a tiny dose of radiation for a lot of people is the same as, it gives the same number of cancers as a large dose for a few people. Um, up to some limit where the people are just dead and you don't, they don't get cancer. Um, but other people propose this threshold model where anything you know, below 100 millisieverts per year is just not noticeable, and, but nobody really knows. The other thing people really know is I said, when I, when I show those cancer numbers, I said number of additional diagnoses per year is that you know, for the rest of the life of the person who's been irradiated? Or is it a, a spike that, that gets better over time? Or is, it, or is it even this? Is it that your rate of increase of cancer risk has increased? And so as you age, you, you become more and more susceptible. Nobody knows. There's, there's absolutely no reliable data on this. I've seen hints at, that the line goes up and back down, but it's, it's really not my specialty. OK, so that's, that's what a radiation dose means if you get one. Why are you going to get one? Or who's, who's going to get one and, and from what? So here's the three populations of radioactivity. What's going to get out? Uh, this, ch this chart is singularly uninformative on the question, because what you care about is the chemistry. Here's our, here's our periodic table. We've got um, hydrogen, helium, and so on. Here's our actinides down here. And here's, the, here's where induced radioactivity shows up. Stuff the reactor is made out of and some stuff in the air. Here's where fission products show up. Rubidium through indium-ish, iodine through gadolinium-ish are the sort of two populations of fission products. Um, very inexact uh, picture here. And the, the, the actinides themselves are stuff sort of above and below uranium all the way down to where it becomes stable again, which is lead. These are not technically actinides, and they behave a little differently. So how do you figure out what's going to get out of the reactor when it, when it goes off? Well, I don't know. Let's, let's look at the chemistry. And here's the chemistry. Roughly speaking, there's stuff in the middle. The actinides, most of the transition metals, are, are they're metals. They behave like metals. They don't dissolve in water particularly well. They, don't, they, they have high melting points and high boiling points. You can heat them up for a ways before they go into the atmosphere. There are a couple of things which are, which are worse. Um, over here, we have gases. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and the noble gases, argon, xenon, radon, helium, are, are just gases at room temperature. If you have a bunch of gas in a bottle, it can just come off the top without, without too much trouble. There's a bunch of other stuff which is, which is not actually gaseous, but is at least either sort of low boiling point or water soluble, or anyway, much more volatile than, than the metals. And that's a, that's a particular worry. So that gives you a guide to how stuff is going to come off of reactors. The gases are going to come off first. The water soluble or sort of generally mobile stuff is going to come off next. And this is, I think, what? Let's see, tellurium. That's, this is technetium in the middle. It's a little more water soluble than, than most things. And the, the metals are, are hardest, to, hardest to liberate. So they, they're, they're sort of safest. A very crude sketch of a generic reactor. Um, you've got a pile of fuel. It's all mixed together, and it's mixed together with its decay products. There's no way of separating them. So you just have this puddle of all kinds of hot stuff you know, in a can. You, you don't want that in contact with the water, so you surround it with this, this zirconium uh, alloy, which is particularly good at withstanding radiation and being in contact with water. And that thing is sitting there being hot. If the reactor is healthy, there's, there are some activation products out here, and that's your sort of routine radiation release from a reactor. But in the environment, I mean, there's really practically nothing outside of here. So when there's a let's see, I had a note on this. Um, when there's a meltdown, what happens is this gets so hot you lose some of the coating. So some of this protective zerk alloy comes off or splits or, or dissolves or burns somehow. And so some of this fuel is, has gotten out and, and liquefied, or at least lost its structure. This is probably not a good picture. So stuff that can get into the water is now in the water. Cesium iodine, that's all that's all floating around in here. Stuff that can get into gas form. Which, which probably also includes some iodine, is, is in the gas. But if your containment vessel is still intact, there's still nothing in the environment. You have a hot tank, and, uh, and you don't care about the details. If you're a three-mile island, the next thing that happens is that the pressure in the tank is too high, so you vent it. You don't vent the bottom. You don't want this water to come out, but you, you do have to vent the gas on top. Three-mile island was a nuclear accident involving a, a meltdown of the fuel, 
So you had a bunch of it puddled up in the reactor. Pressure rose in the containment vessel, and the operators were forced to, or decided to, or I, I actually don't know the details. They somehow had to vent this headspace to, to get the pressure down. So at Three Mile Island, all this stuff that was in the steam got into the environment. So there's a big release of radioactive krypton, xenon, some radon. And that was it. Thereafter, this was shut off, this was cooled down somehow or other, and we were left with a, a big tank full of radioactive stuff, but not all that much radiation release by, by reactor standards. What's going on at, 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 at the Fukushima uh, site is that something else has breached in this containment, and, and we'll learn more about this. I'm, I am so far from an expert on this. But roughly speaking, um, this allows, this gives you access to many more routes for stuff to get out of the fuel, including things that, that don't particularly volatilize, like maybe technetium, but that, that dissolve in water. So whatever, whatever water is escaping, and I don't know the details of this, whatever water is escaping is, is allowing, um, has the potential to allow more radionuclides to get out. And so that's step two. Uh, these, are still mostly, these are still mostly fission products, still beta decay stuff. Where things get worse is when the fuel is on fire. And there may be reports as of uh, very recently today that, that some of the fuel is on fire. Um, uh, it wasn't clear as of a few days ago. Fuel is on fire means oxygen has gotten in here. Hot fuel is exposed. There's no water covering it up or cooling it down. And metal, metals do burn. Um, they are flammable. They would rather be oxidized than, than metallic. And this, this is bad. Because once you're, once you're oxidizing stuff, well, fission products can oxidize, act actinides can oxidize, and they all form smoke, and the smoke is radioactive, and that's your problem. That's the serious problem. Um, uh, and that's where a Three Mile Island-like um, no detectable cancer sort of event turns into, turns into the crisis that's happening now. Um, this is very bad, but still not as bad as Chernobyl. How was Chernobyl worse? Well, how wasn't Chernobyl worse? There wasn't a containment vessel of any, of any sort. The lid just popped off when the pressure increased. Um, the core was conveniently filled with graphite. Graphite's flammable. It's like coal. It's like a, take, so take a bunch of hot uranium, ramp it up to 400 megawatts, and then pour it on top of a mountain of anthracite coal, and let it set on fire. And that's what happened at Chernobyl. Um, so not only was, it, was, the, was Chernobyl burning like crazy, but the reactor was fissioning. It was on. It was a working power reactor producing fissions right up to the last second and possibly afterwards. I'm not, I'm not entirely clear on that point. Um, by contrast, Fukushima has been, was turned off when the earthquake happened, and it's been off for five days. It is a warm reactor, but it is not, a, it is not a, 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 an operating reactor. Um, in, in the case of Chernobyl, there's a picture of, of the site from above. Um, this, is, this is just off Wikipedia, uh, which has a very good article on the topic, as far as I can tell. Um, this is, you see a little, I've zoomed in here. You see this little ring? That's the lid of the reactor sitting there open, and if you look down here, you're looking into the bowels of, of a live reactor. This was all an explosion followed by enormous fire. There's a big plume of smoke that went up, and the smoke was, was what carried most of the radiation dose into the atmosphere, which then starts falling down all over the neighborhood. Um, and putting, putting this out required just ab absolutely incredible sacrifice. So why is Fukushima is not that bad, and why is it not that bad? A couple of saving graces. Um, it, it's, I, the reactor survived the earthquake intact. It was a 9.0 magnitude earthquake and a bunch of reactors sitting right on top, and nothing tipped over, nothing cracked in half. Um, and except for the tsunami, I, I, things, were looking, things were looking rather, uh, rather good. They shut down properly. They inserted their control rods, turned off their fusion, uh, turned off their fission reactions. And then they survived a couple of days before any of these breaches started, and that's a, that's a really remarkable thing. Uh, these fission products, remember, you've been manufacturing fission, or you've been manufacturing fission products as long as you've been generating power. They're all radioactive, so they're all eventually going to decay, but a whole lot of them decay pretty fast. So, if I, so this is a graph of how much radioactive power there is as a function of time. It's a log scale. So here's an hour, here's a day, here's a week, here's a month after you've turned off a reactor. So the fact that Fukushima was off for at least an hour saved a factor of five on amount of, of harmful stuff in the fuel um, relative to Chernobyl. Survived for a day, that's a factor of 20. 
Uh, another thing that's worth noting is the thing that's catching on fire right now is not live fuel. It's a 100-day-old spent fuel station. That's 100 times less radioactive than, than Chernobyl was in, in fission products. So that's a, that's, a, that's, that's a stroke of luck there. Um, uh, that, it didn't have to work out that way. Uh, another thing that's, that's really a tremendous saving grace is the presence of an evacuation. Uh, fairly prompt and not maybe not thorough enough, we'll see, uh, but certainly a, a nearby evacuation. By contrast, at Chernobyl, there was a city of 50,000 people, um, what, two, three, four kilometers away from the site. They weren't, they weren't evacuated until the next day. Um, uh, in the 30-kilometer zone around Chernobyl, there were another 30,000 people who weren't evacuated for two weeks. All this radioactive smoke raining down in their heads. Um, it, it was it was it was really very very bad. It was as bad as it could be. I, I found a quote in one of my books. Uh, five days after the fire, um, Russian officers coming up to a woman who is eventually going to be told to to evacuate. She asks what's going on. She says, "Don't worry, just keep on milking your cow." And she kept on milking her cow, and the cows turned out to be the source of all the iodine that was going into the kids that gave them thyroid cancer. Um, so new slides to watch. What are you what are you watching out for in the news? What's coming out of this reactor? Um, this is the so here's some of the moderately volatile stuff that certainly should be coming out now. Um, iodine-131 is what caused most of the cancers at Chernobyl. There was a lot of it released, a lot of it got into people via this cow route. The iodine falls on the ground, cows eat the grass, iodine goes into the milk, kid drinks the milk, and there were people, survivors actually, who had doses of uh, 100 sieverts to their thyroid. Remember, five sieverts in the whole body is fatal. 100 sieverts in the thyroid gives you thyroid cancer pretty much right away. But there are survivors with that sort of condition. It's a short half-life. It's not that, you know, you don't have to run away for too long, and it'll, it'll go away on its own. Um, iodine rained out all over Eastern Europe, and that was a, rather quickly in those first eight days, there was a, about a half millisievert to just sort of everybody in Bulgaria. Lots of Eastern Europe had this. Cesium and strontium are really are sort of the worst of the of the of the crew. They spread widely. They're very they're very mobile. Um, the rest of Eastern Europe. So add in the cesium dose, and you get another millisievert over the next 30 years while this stuff is still around. It is still around. It's still detectable. Um, strontium similar. Uh, there's less of it, but it accumulates in bone in particular when when you ingest it. Um, neither of them are all that mobile, so they, I don't think they migrate in groundwater too badly. Plutonium-241 comes out later. There's a lot of it, lots, lots, lots of it, a little shorter half-life. And for reasons I'll talk about, it's easier to decontaminate. Um, when the fire starts, as the fire may have already started, is when, when the, well, you remember, the, these reactors aren't out to produce strontium. They're not out to produce iodine. They're out to run just as much fission as possible, which means they really want as much short-lived radioactivity as they can get. You, know, you want to pump all of your uranium down into this train and get it stable as fast as possible. So there's lots and lots of stuff in that collection with very short half-lives. If you have a lot of stuff with a short half-life, it means it has to get rid of itself really fast, which means it goes decay, 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 decay. Very fast decays means uh, lots of radioactivity per unit stuff. So here, it just, this is just some of the things most abundant in, uh, in Chernobyl soot. Um, some of it very short-lived, three days, but that's I mean, tremendously, tremendously radioactive. Um, 30 days, 60 days, and you have, to, you have to leave town for a while before a 60-day element will have decayed you know, multiple times, or such that it's really all gone. Um, nice thing about the soot is it doesn't go as far 